Good afternoon, students, and welcome to today's lecture on sport in the Aegean Bronze Age. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and in today's lecture, we're getting on our trireme. We are sailing north from Egypt, sailing west from Mesopotamia, and into the wild world of the ancient Mediterranean. That's right, specifically, we are headed into the Aegean Sea, so the body of water that lies between modern-day Greece and modern-day Turkey. And this place was the birthplace and the homeland of ancient Greek culture as we know it. Now, sometimes we tend to think of ancient Greece as kind of surpassing the achievements of ancient Near Eastern empires, at least kind of in terms of their lasting impact on contemporary society. And it's not hard to think why that's the case, right? With developments like democracy and classical architecture and philosophy and all those awesome things. But when we look back at the Bronze Age, this certainly was not the case. So the Aegean got started way later than its Near Eastern counterparts. But eventually, things did get rolling, and the mighty palaces at sites like Knossos and Mycenae and Tiryns and Festos, all of those attest to an increase in complexity during this period. And along with those architectural wonders, we also get the invention of sport in the Greek world, or at least some sort of type of like proto-sport. So if you are ready to journey into the labyrinth, to investigate the origins of athletics in the Greek world? Come along with me as we investigate sport in the Aegean Bronze Age. So we have seen some candidates for kind of quote unquote the world's earliest sport in places like Mesopotamia, in the fertile lands, right, between the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys, and as well in Egypt, right, in the Nile River Valley. But when does this like all get going in the Greek world, right? I mean, the Greeks with inventions like the Olympics and the, gymna and the gymnasium and the stadium, those are all synonymous with ancient athletics. So why does it feel like they're kind of relative latecomers to the game? That's our goal for today, right? To figure out how and when and why this all gets started in the Bronze Age Aegean world. But of course, that's not our only goal, right? We've also got to figure out why this is the case. Why do these sports emerge? How do they articulate with other aspects of Bronze Age Aegean culture? And where does this all fit into the big scheme of Greek history? Does something like democracy lead to the creation of sport? Or is it the other way around, right? Does sport somehow have a role in the development of democracy? Or all these, are these cultural traits, are they just kind of completely unrelated? So let's go ahead and start digging for some answers. So before we get into the Aegean, right, let's briefly set the stage here. We're currently in the Bronze Age. So remember the Bronze Age runs from around 3000 BC to about 1200 BC. And it's during this time that we basically get the rise of complex civilizations. So the Sumerians and the Akkadians and the Babylonians in the ancient Near East, right? And then the ancient Egyptians growing out of the Nile River Valley. And in the Aegean, we have more or less the same thing. It just all happens kind of about a thousand years after those previous cultures. So whereas the pyramids were flourishing in the 2000s BCE, the Aegean palaces that we'll look at today, right? They are towering over their landscapes in about the 1000s BCE. So... Within the Bronze Age cultural ecology, you can think of the Aegean as something like your tiny baby brother, right? At first, they're just kind of a little weenie there, right? And you want to beat up on them, and you can do that pretty easily. 
But once they get older, right, and they grow up a bit, they do become pretty formidable too, right? Oh, and your little brother also invented democracy in the Olympics. Anyway, on the Greek mainland, this culture is known as the Mycenaean culture, after the biggest and most badass site on the Greek mainland, right? The Bronze Age citadel of Mycenae. And on the islands, and especially the island of Crete, this culture was known as the Minoan culture. So let's go ahead and start there. We'll swim across the Aegean to the island of Crete and figure out what's up with the Minoans. So first of all, you're probably like, the Minoans? Why the crap aren't they known as the Cretans, right? You know, because they're from the island of Crete, just like the Mycenaeans are from Mycenae. Well, I'm glad you asked. That is a great question, and it's got a fantastic answer. Now, nothing to do with ancient athletics, mind you, unless you count young Athenian boys being killed by a minotaur as a kind of super weird version of athletics. But I'd like to tell the story anyway, and because I'm the professor, you're going to hear about it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the story of the birth of the Minoans. Now, like most great stories, this all begins with Zeus turning himself into a bull so he can steal a Phoenician princess named Europa and fly her off to the island of Crete. And if you've ever taken my mythology class, you'll realize that that's about 90% of Greek mythology there, right? Zeus turning himself into a variety of animals so he can get busy with various mortal women. Not very cool, Zeus, to be honest. Not cool at all. Anyway, nine months later, we get the product of this kind of, well, not marriage, but encounter. His name is Baby Minos, and he's born on the island of Crete, and he eventually becomes its first king. Now, as, the, uh, as an island, right, Crete was always important to Poseidon, right, god of the sea. And as a result, King Minos had to sacrifice his best bull to Poseidon each and every year. One year, however, though, Minos had a bull that was just too beautiful to give away. Don't ask me what that means. I have no clue, but it was a good-looking bull. Anyway, he sacrificed his second best looking bull to Poseidon that year. And I mean, like, come on here, right? Like, Poseidon's not going to figure that one out. Anyway, when he does, he comes up with some really messed up poetic justice here. So Poseidon makes the wife of King Minos, a woman by the name of Pasiphae, fall in love with that beautiful bull. And she's so in love with that bull that she has her palace architect, a man by the name of Daedalus, actually build her a kind of cow costume so that she can get inside the costume and have, well, relations of the most intimate nature with this beautiful bull. I told you, Greek mythology is wacky stuff, guys. I told you this. Now, anyway, we're not going to dwell on Minos and Pasiphae's love life after this. I mean, imagine your girlfriend cheating on you with an actual cow. It probably wouldn't end well. But let's just say, right, nine months later, the Minotaur, half man, half bull, was born. Now naturally he was hideous, right? And he was so disgusting in fact that Minos locked him up in the labyrinth beneath the palace built by the palace architect Daedalus, right? The same guy who built that cow costume. Now if you're wondering how he stayed employed after building the bull costume for Pasiphae, I'm curious as well, right? They don't get into that in the ancient myth. I guess she just wore the pants in that relationship. Anyway, Athens was in debt to Minos and the Cretans at this time and they had to send seven young kids to Crete each year. Now, Minos would send them into the labyrinth as fresh food for this hideous minotaur. But that all changed when the hero Theseus volunteered to go and made his way to the island. So once on the island of Crete, Theseus seduced Ariadne, daughter of the king, and he got her to help him. So Ariadne gave Theseus a ball of thread, right? Which Theseus then left behind as he went into the labyrinth. A perfect strategy so that once encountering and hopefully killing the Minotaur, he could then find his way back out. Now, after finding the Minotaur, an epic battle ensued, and eventually Theseus slew the Minotaur and then used that thread to find his way out of the labyrinth. But even happy stories can have a sad ending. So when Theseus set sail back for Athens, he actually forgets to change his sails from black to white, indicating to his father that he's arrived safely from this journey. But his dad, King Aegeus, gets so upset when he sees those black sails, thinking his son is dead, that he throws himself off of a cliff. I mean, bad move, Theseus. Remember to change the sails. Anyway, it does, however, give us our name for today's lecture. 
So the Aegean Sea is named after poor old King Aegeus, who throws himself into the, the sea. So what in the world did the Minoans have to do with ancient athletics then, right? Now we know how they came about. What did they have to do with ancient athletics? Well, it actually all begins with the Minoan palace of Knossos. Now, Knossos was the largest of the Minoan palaces, and it's located in the middle of the north coast of the island of Crete. It was excavated by a guy by the name of Sir Arthur Evans around 1900 CE, but its original construction dates all the way back to about 1900 BCE. And architecturally, this palace is complex, right? It's so complex that it's not only the, the home of the kind of mythical labyrinth of King Minos, it was also the center we think, for early sports on Minoan Crete. Now, what we see evidenced in the archaeological record at Knossos is evidence for a variety of athletic performances. So we see things like acrobatics and dancing attested in these frescoes and art. And the huge size and large open areas of the palace suggest that the palace may have been an arena, right? An arena type of place where people could gather to watch such events. Now we also have evidence for other sports, right, kind of quote-unquote sports, that have maybe fewer parallels in later history. And we have to wade through this confusing evidence to try to determine what was actually going on. But before we look at that specific Minoan evidence, let's take a minute to describe what we're looking at here, right? So one of the best preserved archaeological features from Minoan sites are the painted frescoes. That's what you're looking at here. And if you've ever wondered what makes a fresco different from a normal painting, it's all about the process. So this fresco, and all frescoes actually, right, they are painted on wet plaster. So the pigment, right, the color, actually becomes part of the wall when it dries. And the Minoans loved their frescoes, right? In particular, they were fond of floral and faunal themes, things like dolphins and fish and trees and octopuses and weird blue monkeys and all sorts of that kind of stuff, right? And with this peaceful environmental iconography, along with the super fact, like super weird fact that Minoan palaces, nowhere on the island, none of them have defensive walls, which is super weird in, in Bronze Age antiquity. Normally the first thing you do is build a defensive wall. Anyway, this kind of peaceful iconography combined with the lack of defensive walls, well, it makes you kind of think of the Minoans as something like the hippies of the ancient Mediterranean just painting weird blue monkeys and hanging out peacefully with everybody else. Now, one of the frescoes that tells us about Bronze Age Aegean sport is known as the Boxing Fresco. And this dates to around 1550 BCE. And it comes from the island of Thera. Today, we know that as Santorini. Anyway, what we see here are two youths engaged in what appears to be ritual combat. I mean, they're certainly fighting, but they don't appear to be, uh, appear to be trying to kill each other. They're of similar age, their hands are wrapped in similar ways, right, with something like boxing gloves. And this sort of thing is kind of a great example of what we mean by uh, regarding Minoan kind of quote-unquote sports, right? It certainly looks like boxing, but we don't have a kind of written evidence, right, a written record about the rules of the competition. We don't know whether there were prizes. We don't know which spectators got to watch or anything of that nature. We more or less have to kind of put together our story based around the imagery and what we know from modern culture and other ancient cultures as well. It's a kind of speculative venture. Now, the boxer fresco isn't the only evidence we have for boxing in the Minoan world. We also have a ceramic vessel known as the boxer riton, with the riton basically being a name for a pouring vessel in the, the ancient Greek world here. Now, it dates to the 16th century BCE, right around the same time as the boxing fresco. Uh, and it appears to show several different sports on kind of different levels or different registers. So on the top, right, we do get to see two men engaged in some sort of ritual combat, right? And they appear to be boxing or wrestling with kind of the same flowing hair in their wrapped hands that exist on the boxing fresco. Now, with these multiple strands of evidence, we can feel fairly certain that boxing, or at least something kind of like it, was indeed a sport. Uh, or at least a performance or a spectacle or something along those lines. Uh, a sport or, you know, something similar in elite Minoan culture. All right, we are switching sections, but we are back on the same artifact here, right? Right back to the boxer Raitan. Now, 
we get to see something even more interesting as we move our way down those registers. So we start to see a man who appears to be um, dressed similarly, right? He's got the flowing hair, he's got the loincloth, right? But instead of fighting another man, he's leaping over the back of a powerful bull. Now this, of course, immediately makes one recall the kind of myth of the Minotaur, right? Half man, half bull, that is at the center of the origin story of Minoan culture. So what's up with this, right? Is bull leaping a performance? Is that something that they do for fun? Is it a competitive sport? Is it a ritual uh, activity re like associated with religion? But the problem is, it's tough to answer the specifics on those questions because we don't have written records, right? At least ones that we can read. So some of the Minoans did have a written language that we call Linear A, but it hasn't yet been translated. And it likely won't yield an answer to that anytime soon. Now, that being said, it is clear that the bulls and bull leaping was a central part of Minoan sport or performance, however you'd like to define that. So in addition to the Raiton, one of the most iconic Minoan frescoes, right, shows a similar scene, and we can see that over here. Now, what we get here uh, is a young man leaping over the back of a bull with kind of two lighter-skinned men on each side. Now, impressively, right, this athlete doesn't have a name, right? In fact, we don't know uh, from texts exactly what's going on here. But he does have a sweet leaping ability, and he's got more courage and confidence than I could muster on my best day. I am glad that we left the bull leaping to the Minoans, and that this isn't something that I had to do growing up. Anyway, nice work, guy. If I tried to do this, I am almost certain I would get gored and trampled almost immediately. Anyway, there's a lot of debate about how exactly this worked, right? So no one's really sure who the guys in white are. Some argue that they're judges, right, in a competition. Other are, others argue that they're priests um, or even just people there to make sure that the uh, contestant or the performer doesn't get injured. And there's also debate about whether women participated or not. So some people imagine that the jumper just leaped over the charging bull, while others argue that the athlete would grab the bull's horns and then when the bull kind of jerked his head up after that, he would propel the jumper into some sort of somersault or some other kind of sweet move over the back of the bull, right? So it's either just jumping over the bull as he charges or kind of doing a vaulting, leaping type thing by grabbing the horns and then launching yourself over. Now, this is one of the most iconic Minoan frescoes of all. And before we move on, I want you to take a look at one more thing, right? Just take a second to see how much of this here has been restored. So the darker portions are original, but the lighter pigment, that's all restoration. And just kind of keep that in mind as you move forward looking at the evidence here. There's a lot of imagination that goes into the kind of comprehension of Minoan material culture. Now, even with that restoration, we still feel pretty confident that bull leaping was a big thing. We've now seen it on the Raiton and in the fresco, but we also have small bronze statuettes showing something similar. And we also have a gold seal with bull leaping displayed on it as well. And beyond that, we've got other references to bulls too. So the architectural bull horns that we see over here, these are known as the horns of consecration. And they're thought to be places uh, of sacrifice, right? They're sacrificial altars. And the bull's head with these kind of golden horns, this is serving as another right time. You put wine or something in there and you could pull it out of the nostrils or mouth of the bull. So even though we don't know the details of a lot of how this, this bull leaping would have occurred, the sheer amount of evidence suggests that the Minoans put on bull leaping performances, perhaps competitive, and possibly held in these kind of large central spaces within Minoan palaces. Although we still really don't know exactly how they were judged, or whether they were competitive, or who got to watch, or if there were any prizes. So we can feel certain of kind of some things, uh, a lot less so of others. So when it comes to the Minoans, we've got some sports that seem pretty familiar, right? Our boxing, our acrobatics, dancing, that sort of thing. And some that seem pretty weird, right? Like jumping over the back of an 800-pound bull. But however that worked, it also seems to be young, wealthy, aristocratic men, right? These men with these very long hair, right? Like participating. But without written records, it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly how all these things worked. All right, now finally, let's set sail west across the Aegean uh, to the Mycenaean culture of mainland Greece. 
And if the Minoans were the hippies of the ancient Mediterranean, the Mycenaeans, they were the warriors of Bronze Age Greek culture. Now, it's impossible to consider Bronze Age Mycenaean sports without referencing Homer's Iliad. And the Iliad has been somewhat of a blessing and a curse all at the same time. So Homer sets his story, right, his epic poem of the Trojan War, back in the late Bronze Age, perhaps during the period of Bronze Age collapse. And in the narrative, we have a major scene where Achilles puts on a series of funeral games in honor of the death of his best friend, Patroclus. Now, on the surface level, this seems like great evidence for sports in Mycenaean Greece, right? We get funeral games set in the Bronze Age. The problem, however, is that Homer was writing nearly like 400 years, right? Writing or composing in some way, nearly 400 years after the collapse of Bronze Age culture. And then he was projecting it backwards onto what he thought that culture was actually like. So to get a better sense of what was actually going on, we actually need to take a look at the archeological record from the Bronze Age to see what we have there. Now, very much like the Near Eastern empires that we've talked about, the Mycenaeans have left us evidence of hunting that would suggest that this was one of the ways that aristocratic Mycenaean men would have demonstrated their power over nature. So we can see here, right, in this late Bronze Age fresco, the hunting of a boar. But just like that, uh, of those in the, the Near Eastern Empire, it seems to kind of stretch uh, the definition as to whether this was or was not a full-fledged sport. Now, funerary evidence also gives us evidence for some sport-like activities, right? So here we're looking at something that's known as a larnax, which is basically a box for ashes for the dead. And on this larnax, we have pictorial evidence that some scholars use to suggest the presence of funerary games, kind of just like the funeral games of Patroclus. So what we can see, if you look a little bit closer, we can see two chariots down in the bottom register, two people with swords perhaps engaged in some sort of ceremonial combat, something almost gladiatorial in nature. But that being said, it's tough to tell exactly what's happening without written texts, right? Were they competing? Were they performing? Were they actually trying to kill each other? The thing is, we just don't know. So to sum up the Mycenaeans, we get a lot of material evidence for militaristic culture that puts a kind of heavy emphasis on physical strength and militaristic prowess. And we can see in the Cyclopean walls of Mycenaean towns, right? And in the hunting scenes of Mycenaean frescoes, and in the funerary iconography of people fighting on this larnax, right? And even in these inlaid daggers that you're looking at over here, which themselves are weapons, and then on the weapons portray a hunt, right? So it's almost two different levels of uh, militarism there. And if you're wondering, right, where you've seen these kind of dagger type things before, well, just check out the opening of uh, the opening credits of Game of Thrones, right? The opening credits steal their idea exactly from these Mycenaean uh, daggers. And it's pretty sweet that we kind of um, have the lasting influence of this, right? 2,000 years, more than that, 3,000 years later. Anyway, uh, while we do have clear evidence for kind of the respect for strength and power in Mycenaean culture, again, we don't really have particularly clear evidence of kind of um, the exact nature of these competitions if they were indeed competitions. So we don't know about prizes or spectators uh, and how that would parallel what we actually read about in Homer's Iliad. So let's now shift away from Mycenaean Greece and sail east over to the Hittite Empire located in central Turkey, a region that we refer to in the ancient world as Anatolia. Now, the Hittite Empire might be thought of as one of the descendant empires, right, of the ancient Near East. And if you're looking at the map here, right, it's the region in blue and kind of the upper middle part. Now, just like the Near Eastern empires, right, we get our fair share of Hittite imagery where there's some sort of king who's showing or demonstrating his ability to dominate nature by subduing powerful and wild animals like lions and bulls and dinosaurs. Well, well not dinosaurs, but you guys get the point. Anyway, but we also have some evidence for kind of quote-unquote sport in a more Greek sense, where there's an actual competition and between people, right, and an actual winner of that competition, a loser in that competition, and prizes involved in that event as well. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at that. So one of the key characteristics of Hittite culture was their focus on religion and religious festivals. So something incredible like 
165 days a year had some sort of religious festival attached to it, right? And we have evidence for what those kind of festivals looked like, and many of them included some sort of kind of parade or procession, right? And we can see that in these sort of things like relief sculptures that we've got over here. Now, what you can look at if you look a little bit closer, you can see a sword swallower, you can see acrobats uh, on ladders, you can see dancers, and in other reliefs, you have evidence for the kind of more traditional things, right? Lion hunts and demonstrations of athleticism and power. So to some extent, this is fairly similar to what we get with the Minoans. But when we look at the written texts, so the uh, Hittites had text as well, uh, we actually get more evidence for competitive events. So we get those details that were kind of missing from the Minoan in the Mycenaean worlds. So what we're looking at over here is a cuneiform text that describes some of these competitions. Now cuneiform is the name that we give that kind of wedge-shaped script of the Hittites and of other early Near Eastern empires. And in one of these inscriptions, we see the prizes that are given to the victors of these competitions. So here's what it says. It says, they run and he who wins, that one seizes the bridle, right? The bridle being a uh, thing that you would use to um, uh, yoke a horse or something like that. Another text, this time concerning wrestling, talks of two people competing and only one person emerging victorious. So here's how that one goes. Ours and an enemy's man prostrate themselves to the deity three times. Then they proceed to wrestle. When our man topples his man, they applaud. And in this case, right, we can see that sports are indeed actually competitive, right? It's not just a performance, it's actually a competition. And we can see the potential prizes, right? We can see the connection to the gods. And we can see that there are indeed spectators watching. So a lot of those details that were missing from uh, Minoan and Mycenaean culture we're now getting in very, very fragmentary, very, very partial, uh, very, very limited form, but they're nonetheless in Hittite culture. And in this, we can see that the sports are competitive, right? Uh, there are the potential for prizes, the connections of the gods, spectators, all those things. Now, scholars disagree on the influence that these Hittite sports had on later Greek sports. Did they inspire them, uh, or is it a totally different, kind of totally independent creation in the later Greek world? But they do stand as our first written evidence for competitive sport in the ancient Mediterranean world. All right, so full disclosure here, I had no idea this was a real thing until I started writing this lecture. But if you're wondering what our past meets present focus is for today, you guessed it, modern freaking bull leaping. So apparently, right, there are people crazy enough to still attempt to do this in the modern world. Now, it takes place primarily in southwestern France, and there it's known uh, in French as the Course Landais. But for the most part in the modern world, female cows are used now instead of the kind of larger male bulls. But once a year, they still bring out the full-fledged male bulls, the huge creatures, right, so that they can go out and leap like ancient Minoans. Now, the performance always begins with the marsh, uh, the Marsh Caserienne, which you're listening to right now. Then these professional leapers, known as the sauteurs in French, begin the event. They wait for the charging bull, and then they leap over it at the very last minute, allowing the bull to pass beneath them. And then finally, as a kind of weird end to the whole performance, uh, the whole thing's open to amateurs who don't do the bull leaping, but they do do some sort of kind of weird, wacky, rodeo clown type thing where they're jumping in barrels or running away from the bull, that sort of thing. Anyway, enough of my boring description here. Let's take a look at these guys in action. All right, you have made it to the end of another episode. And in this lecture, we've taken a whirlwind tour through sport, performance, and spectacle in the ancient Aegean Bronze Age. And we saw that compared to the Egyptians and Mesopotamian cultures, the Aegean gets a relatively late start. But once they get rolling, we see some pretty impressive developments. So massive palaces like Knossos and towering citadels like Mycenae. And in the realm of ancient athletics, 
much of what we have is kind of similarly ambiguous to what emerges in the Near East. So boxing and wrestling and hunting and acrobatic performances, we have a sense that these occurred, right? But very little about any sorts of rule sets or details and how it played out and whether or not they were competitive. Nonetheless, there are some new things. So you certainly can't talk about Bronze Age athletics without talking about the awesomeness that is Minoan bull leaping. But whether or not that should be considered a kind of quote-unquote sport in the modern sense, well, there's just not enough evidence since nobody wrote about it in actually written texts, right? Now, finally, with the Hittites, we do get the birth of some aspects of what we associate with modern sport. So things like prizes for the winners uh, and things like actual competition between two individuals. Even though our evidence for that is just kind of a uh, inscription here or there, just a um, very short text or two. Now, that's it for today, but on a final note, you can think of this class kind of like a charging bull itself, right? It's fast, it's strong, it's also hopefully pretty awesome. And if you're able to leap majestically at the right time, you'll have the opportunity to win everlasting glory, or at least a pretty good grade. So, just a couple lessons you can learn from sport in the Aegean Bronze Age.